this this definition we had been uh, discussing it from the very beginning derivatives are contract definitely there is a relation a contract established between two parties right we had been saying that it is a contract between two parties whose pay off uh, whether who uh, who gain or lose depends upon the value of an underlying asset so there are two things which we have to remember when we talk about derivatives the first one is it is a contract and uh, the the payoff in that contract contract depends upon the movement of the underlying asset now we have said that the underlying asset the types you know based on that the derivatives are being classified the underlying asset can be either a share it can be commodity like rubber or it can be a currency like dollar so it depends on uh, on the need of the parties who enter into that contract so uh, when we are talking about uh, uh, commodity basically you can put them in uh, under three heads one is commodity derivative two is equity der derivative and three is currency derivative they are broad classification of a derivative instrument and uh, when we are talking about commodity derivative the the word itself or the term itself indicates that the underlying asset in that contract would be commodity any sorts of physical asset it can be gold it can be palladium it can be any metal so called co copper or steel so that is actually the physical asset the underlying asset would be a physical asset or it can be a financial asset you know it can be a financial instrument like equity or it can be a financial asset like currency right when the underlying asset is in the uh, in the category of a financial instrument or maybe a share we call that as an equity derivative and when the underlying asset is currency it is accordingly called as a currency derivative and these are the broad categories but we are going to we had already discussed we will once again discuss what are the types uh, of uh, derivative contracts okay uh, now when uh, when we look into a derivative market broadly uh, the market you know uh, can be categorized into over the counter and exchange traded now uh, again this is an indicative of oneness uh, you, uh, it is something which is privately entered between financial institutions or other corporations for uh, hedging of their risk or maybe for speculation and when we talk about exchange traded it is the intermediator here would be stock exchange it can be bombay stock exchange or national stock exchange or commodity exchange right so there is a a uh, stock exchange in case of exchange traded derivative uh, transaction so um, looking at it itself we can say that the professionally managed one would be exchange traded because the terms the conditions the rules are formulated by stock exchanges along with rbi reserve bank of india uh so uh basically there is little more transparency been ensured through these transactions when it is dealt through a stock exchange but over the counter you have more freedom it can be customized according to the need of the parties entering into a contract uh, but it is privately transacted so uh transparency or settlement of claims in case of some kind of uh, no uh, ban uh, If suppose if uh, for, if there is no no uh, rules and regulations guiding the, a particular deal, there can be some conflict, maybe conflict of interest that can happen, uh, and the settlement becomes be little difficult because there is no intermediary as a regulatory body or. of course sebi is guiding the total transactions in the capital market but when we look from the perspective of over the counter there would be lot of parties involved in that and it is not so refined as we look into a exchange traded transactions so these are the problems with the over the counter but in case of exchange trader there is another thing it cannot be customized or uh, the the possibilities of customization looking at the demand of the parties engaged in uh, there is limitation because it is not uh, revised every and every now and then the rules been uh, formulated by sebi looking into the conditions of the capital market and the external environment and uh, maybe an individual investor will not be brought under 
consideration when such contracts or rules or regulations are brought into practice. So this is actually the general preview of a derivative market. Now moving ahead, um, normally all the general, the so-called common uh, derivative products uh, are called under the category broad umbrella of plain vanilla derivative products, plain vanilla, plain vanilla products. They are called as, as such because uh, it's very common. It's been uh, practiced by the investors. And uh, once, if somebody talks of, talks about forward, the there are certain unwritten rules and regulations which is being followed all through the years. But uh, in contrast, there are other types which are called as exotic derivative products where the rules, the regulations, the conditions all are being revised depending upon the needs of the parties entering into uh, the derivative contract. See, when we look into the developed markets, they have their own derivative instruments, which when we look from a uh, from an Indian perspective, we may not be able to understand uh, some of it because they have revised it over the years. They have been practicing here and now they have become more or less a developed market with respect to derivative products. So accordingly, they, they have many exotic products which are very new to emerging markets like India. So uh, what I'm trying to say is the, the kind of products which are uh, which we uh, have uh, or which which is available in Indian market are generally called as plain vanilla category of derivatives because we are very new we are an upcoming market very new into a, a derivative market for us it is uh, been introduced only in 2000 way back in 2000 uh, and even though we had a committee we have a lot of discussions which were happening after the liberalization of market in 1991 the actual introduction of derivative instruments happened only in 2000 in the year 2000 so uh, we are comparatively new with respect to derivative markets so accordingly all the products you know the basic derivative products in our market can be categorized as forward future uh, options swaps warranties or, I mean, warrants and um, there are different names which is just a slight alteration of the basic derivative products which are available in the market now coming to a forward market uh, it is uh, uh, it is not traded through the stock market. It is actually a contract normally entered between two financial institutions. Uh, and uh, when we regularize that, when we bring that into a, a official channel through the uh, stock market, we call that as a futures. And futures, we have currency in Indian market. We have currency futures, stock futures, index futures, where the index itself become the underlying asset maybe sensex or nifty becomes the underlying asset then we have commodity futures uh, interest rate futures and options of course a uh, little more freedom with respect to the buying and selling of financial assets when we talk about option it gives an option for selling the financial uh, contract the option is with respect to uh, selling it put option and there are two types which talks about call option and put option call option is for buying and uh, put option is for selling and uh, of course swaps swaps are more or less uh, not through the stock market as i said it is uh, no uh, over the counter here we see two types over the counter and exchange traded swaps uh, and forward generally come under the category of over the counter and uh, futures options uh, it come under the category of uh, through stock exchanges because uh, national stock exchange, Bombay stock exchange, commodity stock exchange generally go with futures and options. Options are very popular in the Indian market uh, because uh, here uh, the investor is given with little more freedom with respect to purchase and sale of asset. Uh, so we uh, we have more market for options as a derivative instrument. Now warrants, we know what is a warrant. It gives uh, no right to 
convert that or purchase uh, equity in future. Maybe they are first in the form of a debt instrument, maybe a bond, but in future, you get an option to convert that into an ownership uh, instrument like share. So such type of derivative instruments are brought under the category of warrants. We are going to learn all these as separate models, um, modules in, in our uh, coming classes. So I'm not going detail into all these, but these are the basic types of derivative products. And broadly, they are called as plain vanilla products because they are very plain. Most of it's been practiced uh, in Indian markets. But apart from that, there are many um, exotic derivative products which, being, which has been extensively used by developed markets, which are not so popular in India. Now, why do we call them as exotic? Because the, your possibility of earning profit is very huge. At the same time, your chance of incurring heavy losses also associated with such instruments. Right? Um, now, uh, the important milestones, when we look from the perspective of uh, Indian market, the important milestone uh, till 1996, okay, till 1996, derivative as such was not being included in our uh, Security Regulation Act, okay. Uh, later, say, through amendment, uh, it was included and uh, the amendment happened in 1999. Uh, before that, uh, the two committees, the two uh, that is a committee headed by L.C. Gupta, called as the Gupta Committee, they were appointed to look into the possibilities of uh, introducing derivative into Indian market and also into what are the regulatory changes that need to be brought into you know, the existing system when uh, we are planning to introduce uh, uh, the regulatory, you know, when we are planning to introduce the uh, derivative instrument. Because initially, when we were defining securities, the so-called derivative instrument was not included in that definition. So we had to start from there. We had to uh, include, revise the de definition of securities by including derivative as such. So we had a lot of groundwork to be performed. So the committee, the LC Gupta committee was, uh, no, was appointed and the committee submitted their report by 1998, proposing to introduce derivative instrument in Indian market. And again, since the committee recommended for the introduction of derivative instrument in our market, another committee uh, called Varma Group, Group Committee under the chairmanship of J.R. Varma was appointed to look into what are the measures that should be adopted uh, in Indian uh, existing legal framework to contain to manage the risk associated with the introduction of so-called derivative instrument. So uh, once the uh, Gupta committee recommended, Varma committee was appointed to look into all these affairs and the committee submitted the report by 1999. Accordingly, uh, the amendment happened in uh, securities uh, uh, regulatory framework. And uh, in our definition, we started from there, including uh, the word derivative and defining that under the broad uh, category of securities. And then uh, BSC, Bombay Stock Exchange and NSC National Stock Exchange got the approval to transact with uh, equity derivative by 2000. So that's where we started with the introduction of uh, derivative instrument in our market. Uh, from there, uh, if you look into the growth cycle, it's not uh, a quick growth which we are having. Slowly we are moving into. Uh, now when we look in, most of it is being taken up by financial institutions and big corporations, individuals. The percentage of individual investors coming into derivative market is very, very minimal. Uh, still the instrument is not very popular, maybe because of the risk factor. People are not aware about, you no. Know, how can they, you know, and what are the possibilities, what are the benefits of these derivative instruments? Most of the uh, secured uh, investors in capital markets still prefer to go into stock market. Uh, but 
uh, we are into a derivative market, especially with respect to financial institutions like banks, uh, export companies, uh, logistic companies. Uh, we also uh, you know, do a lot of derivative transactions for financing our uh, requirement for capital requirement. That's why corporations, they engage in derivative trades. That's where our derivative market is growing when we look from the overall perspective. In individual investor market is not so popular, it's yet to develop, but uh, institutional investors, they are slowly pitching up through uh, derivative instruments. And uh, the, the regulatory framework, uh, when we look into the legal framework, we have Security Exchange Board of India, when we are talking with equity derivative instrument, SEBI is into uh, looking after the affairs that are connected with equity market. And uh, when uh, when we are dealing with interest, like flexible, we, we are going to into such discussions like floating rate or uh, no interest rate swaps and all. Reserve Bank of India is interested with looking after and uh, formulating the guidelines, framing the policies, all RBI, Reserve Bank, the Central Bank of India is interested in the responsibility. And Forward Market Commission, apart from that, Looking into the need of each type of instruments, uh, forward mark FMC, we normally call as FMC, uh, is uh, interested with the responsibility of uh, taking care of matters directly associated with the derivative market, not with respect to a specific uh, instrument category, but general uh, preview of the market is being decided by forward market commission. So these are the primary regulators and uh, the, the existing legal framework when we look from the perspective of India. Apart from that, you have uh, no, many foreign regulatory you know, uh, bodies, uh, many bodies like Foreign Regulator, Regulation Act, regulatory bodies, uh, company law, all these uh, you know, taking up the actions which are necessary from their part in order to uh, enter into a derivative market. So this is the framework. So it started with the LC Gupta Committee. Recommendations were there. When we opened up the market in 1991, there were uh, no uh, enough recommendations to uh, give away for the derivative, to open the market for derivative instruments. But still, the committee was appointed by 1996. Um, further, another committee, Varma Group Committee, was appointed by 1998. And the reports of both these committees combined together led to the introduction of uh, uh, the amendment in the year 1999. And uh, the derivative market uh, opened up in India by 2000, both with Bombay Stock Exchange and National Stock Exchange. Okay. Uh, Moving further, this we had already said when we have, were having offline classes, participants in the derivative market, basically we can classify them into four categories. The first one hedges the genuine investors who would like to shift their risk, who do not want to you know, uh, bear risk, who prefer not bearing uh, the risk, or maybe they do not have risk appetite. They want to hedge it, transfer it to another person who is having an appetite to bear the risk. Say, for example, suppose if I'm an, I'm, I'm an importer, right? Uh, I have a risk of fluctuation in the currency value by the time I make the payment. Or if I'm, if I'm an exporter, I have again a risk in the uh, fluctuation in the currency value by the time I receive my payment. So these are genuine investors, the businessmen who are into uh, dealing with uh, the risk of fluctuation in the price of the asset. So such investors would like to transfer this uh, risk to some party who is willing to take up. Those are called as the hedgers hedgers who are in need of a particular instrument but who fear of change in the value of that asset due to market volatility due to uh, the, the, the due to changes in the market conditions so such people the hedgers okay so that is why we say that hedgers they would like to transfer they would like to share the risk with somebody else who is willing to take it up right and we always say that the other person generally can be a speculator. It's not necessary, but it can be a speculator 
who is willing to take up that risk and take the benefit because of currency fluctuations uh, the speculators they basically aim at making profit through fluctuation in the uh, under price of the underlying assets say for example uh, i come to market as an investor right i have bought maybe 100 shares of infosys as an investor now i fear that i would like to sell this uh, 100 shares after 6 months right i am a short time in investor but i have bought and i fear that the fall there is an expected fall in the price of the share of share price of infosys after 6 months so i would like to hedge the risk with somebody else who is expecting the opposite thing, who is thinking of an increase in the share price uh, of Infosys in future. So maybe I'm entering into a contract with such person. That person can be a speculator who would like to take the benefit from the market through price fluctuation, or he can be an edger who is expecting the opposite move in the market. So uh, both of us are entering into a contract. One of us will benefit. Maybe if my anticipation is right, I will be protected from, from a price fall in my financial asset. And the other party is going to lose it. lose the money. Whatever I gain will be a loss to the other person. So hedgers, speculators, arbitrators are people who are trying to benefit out of fluctuations in two different markets. The, the very good example is we take the example of uh, physical assets. Suppose if I find that um, in the in the real market, in the current market, pepper is being sold at a, um, at a uh, maybe at a lower price than in the future market. So what I will do is I'll try to you know, buy that from the present real market and sell that in a future market. So I'm taking the benefit of two markets, the present market, the current market, and also the future market. What is happening now? Same can happen if uh, two markets like you know, Bombay Stock Exchange or Commodity Exchange market, they are showing two different values for the same asset. I can buy from one market, sell it in another market. So uh, arbitrators basically are aiming at making profit because of fluctuation or difference in the price in two different markets. It can be a real market and a few forward or future market. It can be a real market, two real markets. Right. Earlier, uh, no, before the stringent regulations, we could do that in international markets also. Maybe I'm I'm buying from domestic market, trying to sell that in international market. That is possible now also, but not to that extent uh, which were prevailing maybe five to six years before. Right. Now, when we are talking about margin traders, first thing what we have to understand is they are not making a uh, vast investment in the market. Say, for example, if I take up the value of you know, uh, the previous one, the example which I was saying, I want to buy Infosys share. Suppose if per share is, uh, is costing 3,000. And uh, if I want to buy maybe um, 10 shares, I have to pay 30,000 rupees. But if the margin for Infosys shares are being kept as, at 10%, uh, Okay, at 10 percentage, I can invest 3,000 and go with purchasing shares from the market without making the full investment of 30,000. Right. So these people, the margin traders, they are not making a full investment in the market. They are going with the investment of margin, margin, keeping the margin. Maybe they have to uh, uh, they have to re revise the margin as per the movement of the share price. Suppose if the price of Infosys uh, went from three thousand to four thousand, ten percentage will become four thousand, right? So accordingly, they will have to increase the margin to the difference from three thousand. They will have to go for four thousand. Uh, it can happen in the reverse way. The actual price of Infosys came down. So in that case, from three thousand, it came down to two thousand. They can pull little money from the market uh, and keep what is required as margin. So margin traders, they are actually trying to take the benefit of the market without uh, you know, indulging in heavy financial debt. They are just making the margin investment and trying to make profit out of it.
maybe other uh, such parties they don't have to own the asset they can sell it by buying it by paying the margin money by keeping the margin they can sell it or they can buy it by and uh, transact in a derivative market which is possible uh, just because the market provides them enough liquidity and enough opportunity right so these are the basic four categories of people who would be coming into uh, the derivative market one is hedgers genuine uh, traders who would like to share their risk or hedge their risk who do not have an appetite to bear that or who do not like to bear that then the speculators they are actually people who would like to take benefits uh, by you know uh, through the price fluctuation that is happening in the market through calculated risk Uh, if uh, if you are a wet plus speculator maybe you will engage in such transactions where you are trying to make huge profit out of speculative business and arbitrators generally they are people who would like to take benefit out of the fluctuation or the difference in the price in two different market say so i said the best example which you can find in market is uh, the one who takes from the present market to the future market or a uh, future market to the present market both in both way it can happen so arbitrators are people uh, who try to take the price differences in two different markets and of course we can also find margin traders in a derivative market who try to engage in uh, trading without engaging in huge investment just maintaining the margin and engaging in different types of transactions so these are the different types of participants in a derivative market now going with the next part is uh, the basic functions uh, in a derivative market see as uh, as every market as every financial market derivative is a market which helps in increasing the financial activity as well as uh, achieving so called economic efficiency because when we are talking about uh, you know a market where there are less number of financial transactions uh, people may not be having invest enough investment avenues or people may not be confident enough to come into a market and invest their money so accordingly the companies will find shortage of fund because the investments that are ca- that are happening in a capital market is automatically going towards the capital investment of a company or a corporation so that may not happen if you don't have you do not have a choice with respect to financial markets and financial instruments so that is a primary function that has been performed by a derivative market where an investor investor is given with an option to purchase an asset you have another asset in the market another financial asset in the market where you can lodge your money and of course number of people coming into the market also will be increasing when we when we are talking about another market called derivative market and uh, in the long run that can this can help us in uh, uh, bringing economic efficiency market efficiency within the market and uh, the next is uh, the most important thing is derivative is a future market so when you look into the price movement in that market we can find that yes it is the sentiment of investors with respect to a future asset if investors are very positive uh, the market will have a uh, the movement will be in a increasing trend and if investors find the market to be pessimistic if the investors are finding it finding it difficult uh with respect to price discovery then automatically the price will be showing a decreasing trend so that itself can give a guidance to the investors in the market that in future the market for uh, this particular commodity is going to be a little down or the market for uh, the particular asset say gold the demand for gold is going to increase in future we looking at the future market so that is where you talk about uh, the price discovery it helps in deriving the price at some stage looking into a future market and uh, risk transfer that we know that it helps a uh, investor it gives an opportunity to uh, to the investor for transferring the risk to another person earlier when we did not have an option of you uh, derivative or future market there was no option for us we have to bear that risk if i expect a fluctuation in price i have to bear it 
somehow I have to bear it. I have to anticipate some other measure. But now I have an option of transferring this risk to somebody else who is having an opposite expectation about the market movement. So that is one of the function being rendered by a derivative market. And check on speculation means uh, you cannot go with uh, any type of speculations within the market when the investors are aware about what is happening, when the information is shared with the, the, with the investor category, with the, maybe with the institutional investor group. So uh, the chance of making excess return or as we call as abnormal return is normalized to a condition to different markets. Because it is normalized in the sense, see, uh, the chance of uh, total collapse of a particular institution or maybe a particular financial institution is not only going to affect that institution, it is going to affect the entire market. We know that when Lehman Brothers collapsed in the United States, uh, an emerging country, maybe a developing country like India had its impact, huge impact. Even though we, our financial sector was not affected, many other sectors were affected. So uh, when we are talking about uh, uh, a speculation, which is taking away the entire profit, it is going to affect the public money because it is going to affect the public sentiments also. Because what you are going to do uh, is generally uh, you are taking it out of public money. When you are protecting a financial institution, you are generally taking it out from the public money and then you are giving as a loan to the financial institution. That generally happens in every country. So. Uh, uh, another market, uh, another option for an investor, uh, it ensures that um, uh, there is not too much speculation that is happening in the market. People are aware of what, what, what is happening. Then you are given with n number of options other than just a capital market or share market or a, uh, an investment in a financial institution. You have n number of options. And um, Another thing is when you uh, when the companies are having little flexibility to transfer their risk to get more capital, uh, possibility of taking more loan, not only from the domestic capital market, they can also think of taking a loan from the foreign market, from the international market. The number of activities coming up in an economy will increase. That also, in a way, indirectly reduce the chance of high speculation in the market. People will be willing to take only calculated risk. When you do not have any option to make money, of course, you will go with speculative business. But if you have good options to invest your money, to lodge your money, and to get a fair return, chance of no uh, reckless speculation, uh, speculation without calculating the risk will not happen. So these are some of the functions that is being rendered by uh, the derivative market. First is price discovery because it gives you a direction towards the sentiments of the investors. Then this transfer, we have an option to hedge, to transfer our risk to another person who is having an opposite expectation, right? And uh, finally, the number of economic activities prevailing in economy will increase, which in turn is going to towards something called as financial efficiency or an efficient market. Or last, you know, in our security analysis and portfolio management, we were discussing about market efficiency. That is something which will happen in the long run when investors are provided with a lot of investment avenues and they are given with more chance of coming into a capital market. Right. So that, that is another benefit, another function served by the derivative market. And uh, this is something which you have to work upon. Uh, you have to look into how I have just given you a general preview of how it has happened in, uh, in India with respect to the legal framework. But actually, the different sorts of uh, derivative instrument, even though it, is, it may not be called as a derivative instrument, but it had all the features of derivative instrument, which started with uh, the rice uh, you know, the people know the rice merchants in Japan. That is said to be the first kind of derivative transactions which has happened uh, in the world history. It started over there and then it slowly moved to different countries. Uh, first, the wave went to developed market, then slowly it came, it came to developing and emerging economies. And uh, of course, we also had the wave. Uh, it started in 1991. 
but in 90 uh, maybe in 16th century 17th century we could find uh, the different variations uh, in the so called derivative transaction that was happening in our market so that is something which you have to search for find it prepare and present in our next class so i'll just summarize what has happened in our today's class we started with a derivative instrument we said it is actually a contract that is happening between two parties two parties having opposite expectation generally and uh, the payoff depends upon the movement of the value of underlying asset right then we said that the underlying asset it uh, generally can be a commodity or physical asset or a financial uh, instrument uh, when we talk about a commodity it can go with uh, gold or as you say silver or it can be rubber or paper or cardamom it varies wheat or cotton right and when we are talking about a physical I mean, financial asset it can range from equity you know the so called equity or index or it can even go up to the interest rate the fluctuation you know in the interest rate like floating rate and uh, fixed rate you can swap it between you know? normally financial institutions do that so th those are the general category and all these in the general categories again we the type of contract based on the nature based on the features based on its setup we categorize that as forward future option swaps and of course warrants then uh, you know we said about the legal framework when we look from the indian perspective the legal framework is uh, vested with security exchange board of india Reserve Bank of India, and uh, as I said, the new one, which is uh, Forward Market Commission (FMC). So this this is actually the legal framework, and um, uh, the uh, generally Reserve Bank of India looks into with respect to uh, the interest rate swaps or uh, the those which is dealing with the forward transaction between the financial institutions. So the Security Exchange Board of India generally looks into the financial instrument derivative uh, involving financial uh, instruments and Forward Market Commission. They are engaged in framing the general rules and regulations for the derivative markets in the country. Then we also discussed about uh, the general uh, functions being performed by a derivative market. As we said, they help in the price discovery as well as you no. Know, they provide a better market by giving more investment options ultimately leading to or helping in creating efficiency economic efficiency within the market and uh, in the uh, in the derivative market we normally have hedgers speculators uh, as well as those people who are looking into uh, you know, taking benefit uh, of the market because of the difference in prices existing in two markets they are called as arbitrageurs and you have also margin traders who do not go with the complete who do not take up the risk of complete investment in a derivative market they go with margin investments and uh, try to make profits by entering into different transactions so these are the general uh, no, uh, people, uh, general list of people who come into derivative markets. So that's it. That's a general introduction for you. In our tomorrow's class, we will be looking into the the accounting, the tax accounting aspects, the tax regulations, and also no uh, the time value concept that is very much applicable in a forward uh, in a derivative contract. So 